I Bowen and a very good evening to all our viewers here on TV1. I'm Dr. Dilshan Fernando and this is your weekly dose of wellness here on Healthline. Cancer. It's a word that strikes fear into our hearts and rightly so. It is a condition that can have very severe and debilitating effects on your life. And any form of cancer, if not detected early, can cause very serious effects. Today we are going to be talking about the most common and prevalent cancer globally and as well as in Sri Lanka. If you talk numbers, in 2020, 30,000 new cases of cancer were diagnosed in Sri Lanka. And out of that, 4,000 were breast cancer. So, I'm sure that it is a very important topic for you, our viewers, to know about. Share his expert opinions with us on this matter. We have consultant oncological surgeon, Dr. Neomal Perra, joining us with us here in the studios today. A very good evening to you, sir, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. So, first and foremost, sir, what is breast cancer and are there various different types? Yeah, breast cancer is a cancer which originates from a cell in the breast. Uh, you have to sort of uh, realize that it is not the skin which covers the breast. It is a glandular component which is found inside. Uh, and when a, 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 a genetic mutation or genetic change occurs in one of these cells, where it loses its, uh, the, the sense of uh, stopping multiplication, it can progress into a tumor. So this is breast cancer. So uh, there are so many different types as well, but anyway, to start with, it is originating from the epithelium of one of the ducts. Or it can arise from the, the, the glandular component as well. So depending on where it arises, we can sort of divide into basically into ductal and lobulus. But there are so many varieties as well. Right. Now, talking about any form of disease, there are multiple factors that predispose towards the condition. Now, when we talk about breast cancer, what are the risk factors involved? First of all, I would say uh, breast cancer, when you consider breast cancer, the female sex itself is considered as the most important risk factor. I am saying this because even the males can get breast cancer, about, uh, although it is quite rare, about 1% of the, the total number of breast uh, cancers can affect males. So being a female itself can give rise to uh, increased risk of getting a breast cancer. And the reason behind is that the risk is mainly involves around the female sex hormone, estrogens and progesterones. Now, somebody might ask, okay, how come then the males get breast cancer? Yes, because even among the males, there is a small percentage of estrogen which is being secreted. So, the estrogen and progesterone are the main risk factors which can give rise to a cancer in, I mean, different, different ways. Say, as I said, the first thing is being the female. Second thing is if the estrogen level starts to secrete at peak levels at one particular point of your lifetime and if it starts little earlier than the normal uh, period, say for example, the menses, if the menses are started quite early in life, maybe say around about say 8 years or 9 years, when they attain puberty and when they start to menstruate, if it occurs little earlier, that means they are prone to have more menstrual cycles. That means at each menstrual cycle, there will be an upsurge of estrogens and progesterones. So during these estrogens and progesterone secretions, always during each cycle, they try to prepare the breast for some sort of a preparation in a way of to lactate in the future. But it doesn't happen because each cycle they no one get pregnant. So each cycle the estrogen goes and stimulate the breast cells, and if it, if it keeps on going for many many cycles and many many years until it stops at menopause, and if the menopause get delayed, so those are the two main risk factors: early menarche or the early attained life, and sort of menstruating for long time until the menopause is attained. If it is get delayed by say up to about 55 or 60 years then of course that particular person get exposed to so many estrogen cycles. So those are the two other risk factors to get a breast cancer, early menarche and late menopause. In addition to that, some people, some ladies, they tend to take artificial hormones, say in a, in a way of uh, contraceptive pills or in a way of uh, hormone replacement therapy, uh, even 
uh, the hormone replacement therapy is taken once the the menstruation is over or when they attain menopause they prolong the the the, the uh, hormone uh, uh, environment by taking artificially as hormone replacement therapy in those instances also they are prone to get breast cancer now how can we stop this the way of stopping this uh, uh, peaks appearing is by getting pregnant so pregnancy is in a way it's a some sort of a, a, a benefit where you, it will reduce the risk of breast cancer so if you get pregnant say by about say 20 or so the uh, the these type of menstrual cycles will stop for about 9 months and with the lactation it might get prolonged so up to about 2 years this menstruation will stop so when there is no peak or sort of upsurge of uh, hormones then of course that has a beneficial effect and the breast cancer reduc uh, risk will get reduced but you have to remember this risk elimination will occur only if they get pregnant early in life not after 30 years so if you get pregnant after 30 years still the risk is there but if you get pregnant before 30 years then of course the risk will be minimized and also with I said the the gap or the the upsurges of uh, these uh, estrogens and progesterones will uh, be less during lactation as well so lactation is a is a, a way of sort of avoiding or reducing the risk so these are the the common risk factors associated with a breast cancer occurrence of course there is a, another familial that is which goes in the in the family uh, a gene can be transmitted from your parents or from your gran grandparents into the next generation so even through the the genes or the familial tendencies there with breast cancer and about say 5 to 10 percent of these cancers can come through your through your family genes so these are the basic uh, 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 known risk factors or where there is a indication can be directly related to but of course there are certain uh, unexplained uh, risk factors where uh, yeah, many studies have been able to sort of identify some sort of a uh, association you cannot say it is a direct uh, involvement or direct impact but there is some association with these type of risk factors like uh, smoking uh, then uh, sedentary lifestyle uh, obesity and uh, maybe uh, uh, alcohol so there are so many other risk factors in the sense where you cannot directly relate it and uh, say okay you got this uh, this breast cancer because we have been smoking or it is we cannot directly say but uh, there are many epidemiological studies where they have found some association between these factors as well right so we have come to a very interesting juncture in our conversation as dr nirmal very correctly said breast cancer is a condition which revolves around the female hormonal cycle now you mentioned about this oral contraceptive pill and we know that so many females take this birth control pill now this might strike a bit of fear into their hearts does it mean that everyone who takes this birth control pill are they more prone towards developing breast cancer it is not so uh, it all depends on the the type of contraceptive pill or the the birth pill that they take as well as the duration and whether it is a continuous uh, uh, intake or whether there's some interruption all this uh, usually uh, they, they many many epidemiological studies have uh, identified that uh, combined uh, contraceptive pills where when you say combine it is the estrogens and progesterone both are found within the within the pill uh, when it is so then of course the risk is high now what happens is uh, uh, with these pills uh, it prevents the ovulation and so that's why how, how that uh, the tablet can sort of uh, have a contraceptive effect or prevent uh, getting pregnant so these estrogens and progesterones especially when it is combined together have a very high risk of getting a cancer especially if you have used for about 10 years the risk increased by 1.25 percent something like that uh, compared to another person who has not taken contraceptive pills also the the, the people who take estrogens only uh, the pills can carry some risk so but also at the same time you have to sort of understand that when you stop the contraceptive pills after 10 years with time the gradually the the risk will go off so usually I mean 10 years is considered as a very 
uh, I mean, which carries a risk. What has it done? Done. I normally, when I sort of encourage, or if someone wants to sort of take a contraceptive pill and sort of ask my advice, what I normally say is, not to take more than two years. What has it done? Done, right? And if it, if you exceed more than two to five years, within that age uh, duration, I always tell them to sort of check your breast. And if it is more than five years, it is a compulsory to check your breast. The checking your breast is a total different uh, topic. We can discuss it a little later how to sort of check the breast and all. But uh, the proper testing should be done if you have taken contraceptive pills continuously for more than two years. Up to two years, there's a reasonable, I mean, it is fairly reasonable to sort of accept, we can accept it. But if it is more than five years, of course, it, is, it carries the risk of getting a breast cancer. So, once again, let me reiterate that fact because otherwise it might be misconstrued by our viewers. Just purely uh, being on the contraceptive pill does not increase the risk of breast cancer. If it's taken over a period of time, uh, like Dr. Neoma said, over two years, you should be uh, aware that it can carry an increased risk for breast cancer. Now, you also mentioned this genetic predisposition where breast cancer runs in the family. Now, let's say a person has a strong family history of breast cancer. Does it mean that more often than not that that person will also develop a breast cancer? Yeah, they can, but anyway, there are certain, uh, uh, I mean, criteria that has to be fulfilled. Uh, now, because we always we have to assume in a random manner, now a person to get a breast cancer, it can happen randomly, not to sort of get the gene coming from your uh, from your uh, parents or from your from your family so randomly also you can get about two or three individuals getting breast cancer without the gene so that also you have to sort of keep in mind but first of all when you say the the family now there is a thing called first de degree relatives this is very important to understand who are the first degree relatives are without that we think even the uh, your aunt or maybe your cousin is a first degree relative because we are, I mean, in Sri Lanka, we gather, we, we think that we, that we have an extended family. So, when we are a bit closer to our cousin and when the cousin gets it, we think, okay, we are first de degree relatives. It is not so. Scientifically, the first de degree relatives are one step above and one step below and parallel. So, when you say if you get affected, the one step above is your parents. So, if your parents are considered as father and mother, both are considered as the first degree relatives. Then, Parallel, it goes with your siblings. So, all the siblings are also in the first degree relatives and your children, one step below. So, these are the three steps, one step above, parallel and one step below. Those are the, the unit which we consider as first degree relatives. If it is outside that, say for example, your grandparents your or if it is your aunt or cousins, all belongs to the second degree. So, when we consider the familial tendency, as I said at the beginning, uh, in the world, we have identified out of all the breast cancers, about 5 to 10 percent of the total number of breast cancers comes through these families. But fortunately, in Sri Lanka, these type of uh, familial tendency is little less. Uh, but we normally, when we sort of, when people come and sort of tell that, okay, we have a, a strong family history, we sort of look into sort of in, into details, uh, how they are related and when they get uh, have got the, the, the disease at the beginning. So, all these things are important uh, and we categorize into low, intermediate and high risk. For example, if we take the high risk, I think that is more important for everyone who is listening to this, whether they belong to high risk because those are the group that we normally sort of, we, uh, we check more, more, more in, in detail. Normally, to consider a person as a high risk individual with the possibility of having this gene traveling through the family. At least there should be two first de degree relatives who have been diagnosed with less than, diagnosed less than 40 years of age. So, if it is more than 40 years of age, then of course, it is not related to a familial tendency. So, either two, fam uh, sorry, 50 years, two uh, first degree relatives more than uh, less than 50 years or three uh, first degree relatives less than 60 years or four first degree relatives at any age. So, I do not think it is not, it is easy to sort of find these type of numbers in a family to sort of say, okay, I have this family gene. Uh, 
So, I will repeat it again. If there are two first degree relatives who are less than 50 or three 50 uh, first degree relatives who are less than 60 or four first degree relatives at any age groups. So, those are the people we consider it as a high penetration of that gene in that family. And also, there is one more thing that you have to remember. Uh, when it comes from your family, that means, uh, uh, I mean, some may be, uh, be aware that the genes, they, they go as pairs. So, normally, you should have the, the both genes should get damaged to get the breast cancer. So, if in the, the familial tendency ones or the, the cancers which sort of goes, goes through the families, you know, the gene which comes from your, either from your father or mother is already damaged and it joins with another either egg or the sperm which is a normal one. So, you need to wait until that particular gene to get damaged as well because we have already have one damaged gene. So, because of that, that damage can occur at very young age. So, all the familial tendency breast cancers or which comes through your family, they get breast cancer at very young age and most of the patients, they can have bilateral or affecting both sides. So, it is very important if someone gets a cancer at very young age, maybe about 30 years or 40 years, they have to sort of check whether there is any family history of breast cancers. And saying that, there is one more thing that we have to sort of consider, that is breast cancer, there are certain genes which can give rise to other cancers as well, although it is, we think it is a that it is a breast which goes through the family. Also, there may be other cancers like ovarian cancer, colorectal cancers also can be contributed by this particular damaged gene. So, it is not only the breast which will be there in the, in the family, even if there is ovarian cancers or even if there is a, a colorectal cancers. And very importantly, if there is any member, male with a breast cancer can be considered as a very strong family history of breast cancers. Right. So, if one does develop breast cancer at a very young age, is it indicated that we screen the rest of the family and are these tests available in Sri Lanka? Again, as I said, it is very, very important to sort of uh, see the number of individuals in, involved in that family. It is not only the, the single person, uh, especially when they are detected at very young age. Of course, if it is, if she is the only person who has been affected and if she is about 30 years, then of course, we advise about her children as well as her siblings uh, to just to check. Although it, it could be the, the first person to sort of detect within that family. So, we cannot just uh, leave it aside and say, okay, you are the first person, so do not worry. You, I mean, this could have been a random thing. You cannot just ignore that because as she is very young, and this can be the, she can be the first individual in that family to start with breast cancer. So, we have to advise the other relatives, uh, relatives in the sense uh, her siblings, as well as if she is married, about the children in the future, uh, that they should be checked. Yes, we have the facilities to sort of uh, do genetic analysis and uh, what they do is they look for common uh, mutations, common genes only. We, there are so many genes that can uh, get damaged and sort of can give rise to cancers. But we tend to sort of check for common cancers, uh, common uh, abnormalities in the genes and uh, it can be done in, at the Colombo faculty as, as well as there are private institutions where they do. And uh, it can be done with a sample of blood and uh, not only breast, also they can sort of uh, check for other genes which can carry uh, the the, the genetic component which can give rise to other cancers. So, this can be done in Sri Lanka. I think that is also another important message that we want to convey to our viewers. If you do indeed fall into that high risk category uh, for genetically predisposed breast cancer, there are uh, ways and means that we can test, do genetic testing on your family, but of course, with the guidance of a proper medical practitioner. Now, moving on with the questions. Uh, um, we know that any disease carries um, common signs and symptoms and it is important that our viewers know what to be on the lookout for. So, with regards to breast cancer, what are the common symptoms and signs? The commonest symptom is, uh, is the lump. A breast lump is the commonest one, almost about uh, say uh, 80 to 90 percent of uh, cancers, they present with a lump. But saying this, all the lumps are not cancerous as well. So, whenever someone feels a lump, do not panic. Of course, you should make some 
note of it and sort of get get a, get a, get an opinion as quickly as possible but all lumps are not cancerous almost 80% of the the lumps can be non cancerous or benign ones but when it is a cancer the commonest presentation is a lump and most of the people they think or they wait until there is some pain associated with this lump because they think cancers are very painful disease so they believe okay if there is no pain uh, i should not worry so that is a myth don't think about that because almost all the breast lumps which appears as cancerous at the beginning are absolutely painless so don't wait until you develop pain in in the lump that you detect come and get advice quickly the other common symptoms are uh, i mean sometimes they can have a little bit of blood stain discharge from the nipple and again all blood stain nipple discharges are not cancerous as well and there's another entity called uh, the paget's disease now this is very important very interesting one uh, there's a, a phenomena where when there is a, a disease or a cancerous lesion inside the breast some of these cells can sort of migrate through the duct system and appears at the the tip of the nipple and cause a rash and which is called is known as the paget's disease and uh, some people they tend to sort of uh, ignore this they think it is some sort of allergy because it is there some itchiness and uh, there's a way of differentiating uh, sometimes you you can get eczemas on your nipples and uh, uh, on uh, i mean if it is a eczema if it is eczema it can affect both sides usually and also it will start from the areola area and come towards the center but if it is paget's disease the itchiness will start at the tip of the nipple and that will sort of move towards the periphery of the areola and also it it could be confined to one side so paget's disease is another uh, although i would say not a very uncommon presentation but i have seen many patients uh, who tend to neglect it thinking it is eczematous presentation so those are the the common presentations for early breast cancers of course with that there are uh, i mean if you not detect the lump or if you sort of uh, ignore it then of course uh, there may be the features of an advanced cancer those are when you sort of uh, sometimes raise your hand you will see uh, especially during your self breast examination if when you raise your hands in front of a mirror if you see uh, that particular breast not moving much or if there is skin puckering or sort of dimpling in uh, deep inside uh, that can be a feature of a very advanced malignancy and also sometimes uh, when the the skin lymphatics uh, lymph is a, is a clear fluid which is taken through the lymphatics into the nodes that is uh, nodes found under the armpit so sometimes these cancer cells can go and block this lymphatics found within the skin that will give rise to a, a appearance like a peel of a orange uh, and we call it pure orange Uh, that type of effect where it is all swollen and it appears just like an orange skin so that type of uh, uh, advanced features are uh, should not wait for until that time should sort of uh, come as soon as they, they anyone feels a lump so once again for the benefit of our viewers uh, breast cancer may all, almost always appear as a lump but like dr normal said please don't wait until it's very painful or until the disease is very advanced not all lumps are breast cancer but if you do indeed uh, experience one of these lumps please go uh, to a registered medical practitioner and get the advice uh, now if a patient does indeed present to you with a breast lump how would you go about investigating them yeah first of all uh, we take a in in depth uh, history about the lump and how long she had been having it and about the family history about the risk factors all these things uh, are very important uh, not that uh, we always look for the risk factors because there are people who present with uh, cancer without risk factors as well now otherwise some people might say okay i i don't have any risk factor so i should ignore this lump no it is not that way i mean it doesn't happen like that there are so many individuals without risk factors who get breast cancer at the same time there are lot of ladies with full of uh, risk factors who lives a normal healthy life without getting a breast cancer as well so anyway we take a in detail history and then we examine the patient and we 
do a thing called triple assessment where we assess the lump in three different ways. Uh, as I said, the clinical assessment is very important. We just feel the lump and by, uh, by an experienced uh, clinical practitioner, he will be able to sort of just by feeling it, might be able to sort of say this is cancerous. Of course, we examine the, the armpit and see whether there are any nodes palpable and uh, depending on the stage, we, we might sort of look at other, other organs as well. So, that is a clinical examination. Second is we do, we assess the, the lump by taking pictures or imaging. Imaging is usually done by two ways, the ultrasound scan and the mammography. Uh, now, mammography is, uh, we normally do it uh, for little uh, elderly people like sort of who are over 40s, uh, but uh, for younger ones, we can sort of do only the ultrasound scan. In case if there is a, a necessity, then of course, we might proceed with the MRI imaging as well. Otherwise, usually we do only the ultrasound scan and the, uh, the mammography. Then we go ahead with the third one. Third one is taking uh, some cells from the from this lump and uh, put it into a slide and sort of see it under a microscope to see whether there are any cancer cells. Now, this taking this biopsy, it can be done by two ways. One is a fine needle biopsy. We call it FNAC for fine needle aspiration cytology where we put a normally ordinary syringe, we put it into the lump and aspirate uh, a little bit of fluid and we sort of check it under the microscope. Here we sort of aspirate only cells, so that is why we call it a cytology and uh, the, there are limitations. We might not be able to sort of tell many things with that, but looking at the cell, we might be able to sort of comment whether it is a malignant cell or not. Or better way is to use a co-biopsy. Co-biopsy is a little bigger needle and because of that, we may have to give a little bit of local anesthesia to push the needle in and there we take some tissues. It is like a thread of tissues, we take it. There, of course, we can give more details. By analyze, analyzing in these three ways, we can sort of uh, predict that this is cancerous by 99.9% .9 accuracy uh, or we can sort of say this is not. And if we say this is not, but still if it is doubtful, then of course, we may have to proceed one step further that is by taking the lump out. So, that is basically it can be considered as part of uh, the investigation as well as part of treatment. So, if when you take the entire lump out, we call it excision biopsy, we can send the entire lump for, for histopathology to the lab and then they will analyze it and say okay, this is cancerous or not. But if they say it is not, then of course, this can be considered as a treatment as I said earlier. But if not, then of course, we will have to plan the proper treatment for her. Right. Now, uh, when we diagnose a case of breast cancer, depending on the stage or the spread of the disease, we see uh, various treatment modalities available. We see in certain cases only the lump is taken out as we discussed or in certain cases the entire breast and uh, some in some cases what we call axillary clearance or taking part of the nodes out from the armpit area. So, as a cancer surgeon, what are the considerations when we uh, think about the treatment modalities, which type of surgery that we need? Yeah, when we do the, the initial investigations, we not only think only in the direction of coming, arriving at a diagnosis, we try to sort of figure it out whether this is a early disease or advanced disease as well. Uh, if it is advanced disease, we assume that the, the tumour have spilled beyond the, the region that is the breast and the armpit and it has spilled beyond and it has gone to maybe to other distant organs like the lungs, liver, uh, bones or, or, or the brain. So, I will talk first about the advanced disease. When it has spilled beyond the, the, the region and it has metastasized or spread into other organs, then of course, we consider it as advanced. Also, sometimes the disease can be advanced regionally as well. Say for example, it has penetrated through the skin and it has ulcerated the skin. So, if it has gone to the skin or if it has gone deep and ulcerated into the chest wall, then of course, again this is an advanced disease. Although it has not even probably sometimes we might have a come with a patient who has sort of have ulcerated disease, but it has not gone beyond. We, I mean, when we do ultrasound scan of the liver or chest x-rays of the, the lungs and all, we do not see any uh, distance spread. But we assume that this lump may be advanced for it to sort of ulcerate through the skin and there could be microscopic cells spilled beyond. So, we put label them 
again as advanced disease breast cancer. Now, advanced breast cancer, the important thing that we should understand is no point tackling the regional disease because it has gone spilled over. So, we have to initially think of doing something for the spilled cells because we are just wasting time trying to sort of take the breast out and the clear the nodes when the patient is going to die because of the distance spread. So, we have to initially start with some sort of a, a systemic or a, a, some sort of a, a treatment modality which will sort of go beyond the regional area throughout the entire body. So, the only solution is then is chemotherapy. So, we give chemotherapy by injection, those are injections uh, and we give in, in cycles also and with that we tend to control the systemic disease. One advantage in giving systemic therapy is if we know that this is a very sensitive and the tumor is responding to the chemotherapy, we will notice that the, the tumor, the primary which is found in the breast is shrinking as well. So, that gives us a very good way of judging that chemotherapy is very sensitive. So, we give about say 3 or 4 cycles depending on the, the chemotherapy regime which is which will be decided by the oncologist. Then halfway through, then we know that the, we have treated the systemic disease up to a certain extent, we can move towards surgery. Then we can offer some sort of a surgery, usually total removal of the breast. Then again, after that is done, we will follow with some more chemotherapy and probably with radiation as well. Now, if you talk about early disease and of course, I do not sort of encourage anyone to come with advanced disease, always try to sort of pick it up early because if it is early disease, we can talk about some sort of a, a cure or cure rates, but not for advanced disease. Advanced disease, what we do is we just control the disease. We are not, we cannot cure it, but we control the disease. So, always try to pick it up when it is early because we can cure. Now, when you talk about early, that means the tumor is confined to the breast and probably to an, a single node or so. Then, of course, we have to tackle the regional thing first. So, that is treating the breast. Now, treating the breast, there are long time back, about say 20, 30 years back, we used to do the traditional way of removing the entire breast called mastectomy. And with that, we tend to remove all the nodes as well. There are three levels, but basically up to level two, we used to clear this. Then later on, we dis, uh, many many uh, uh, research uh, work have not, not have, has noticed that there is no need to remove the entire breast. But even if you remove the the lump itself, uh, can be considered as cured, uh, or, or or which gives the same uh, effects as as a mastectomy. And this is known as breast conservation surgery, where we remove only the lump. Some people they call it lumpectomy as well. And uh, basically, there are three components if you do the breast conservation. Now, mastectomy, of course, we remove the entire breast with the, the, the clearance of the nodes. But in breast conservation, we remove the lump. Then we have to do some treatment for the armpit. And we, as we leave almost three-fourths of the breast, we have to give radiation to the remaining breast. So, those three components should be fulfilled to sort of say that we have done a proper breast conservation. And when you compare breast conservation and mastectomy, because now everybody will say, okay, please do breast conservation, do not remove my breast. The survival rates wise, if you take a uh, same person, same age, with the same disease, everything similar, there will be no difference whether you do a mastectomy or a breast conservation, the survival will be the same. So, for example, if the that patient is going to live up to 90 years, whatever you do, mastectomy or breast conservation, she can go up to 90 years. So, the difference is when you do breast conservation, there is a slight higher risk of having a recurrence during this 90 year lifetime, but still it is not going to affect her survival. She will live, but of course, there is a possibility that it could can recur. So, if it is so, because of that, they will, they should be followed by the clinician very frequently at least once a year and do the mammographies and see whether there is any recurrence because of the recurrence rate it is little higher than the mastectomy. So, those are the two uh, basic techniques that we offer for breast conservation. Of course, with the newer surgical uh, technology, uh, even now when we remove the, the total breast, we can offer something different called reconstruction where we reconstruct the entire breast as it is. So, we remove the entire breast, but we reconstruct it again 
to give the same appearance. So, this is the, the basic way of sort of treating the breast for early cancers. Right. So, for the benefit of our viewers, as Dr. Neomal Pereira said, uh, breast reconstruction surgery is possible uh, even though uh, there is a slight chance of recurrence because for a female psychologically the breast is a very important organ. Now, moving on uh, with uh, the surgery, now any surgery an invasive procedure can carry some sort of complications and risks. Now, with this uh, surgery with regards to breast cancer, are there any specific risks involved, any complications involved with the surgery? As, it, as of uh, any surgery, of course, the same complications are found even with breast surgery as well like uh, uh, infections or hematoma or blood clot formation. So, those are, I mean, not that it is very common, but it can happen. Uh, but there are two complications which I should mention, uh, especially when you do the, the nodal clearance, that is clearing the nodes under the armpit. That is, uh, there are few nerves which crosses from the chest wall onto your upper arm and uh, these are the sensory nerves which is found uh, taking the sensation from the inner aspect of your uh, arm. These nerves have to be cut or it can get damaged during the surgical procedure, especially when you clear the armpit. So, uh, this numbness, it is not a permanent thing, it is temporary thing which with time maybe about, which might take about a year or two, gradually that area will get lesser and lesser and it will go off and also that can be associated with pain around the shoulder as well. So, that is one common complication, uh, sorry, it is not a common complication but can uh, be seen. The second complication I would say is the swelling of uh, the upper limb, again that can occur because of uh, um, many nodes get been involved and when we have to remove a lot of nodes and the lymphatics and uh, on top of that when we offer radiation to the armpit area as well, then of course the balanced lymphatics, especially the lymphatics which carries from the upper limb can get damaged and get can get fibrous and scarred. So, with that the lymph which is the, the fluid within the upper limb uh, carrying towards the, the blood stream and entering into the blood at the neck level can get obstructed because of these procedures and uh, in Sri Lanka of course about 5 percent of the patients who undergo this type of radical surgery under the armpit can end up with a, a condition called lymphedema. Lymphedema is swelling of the upper limb. So, th those are the two common complications that might encounter after this type of surgery. Then again as I mentioned uh, about the reconstruction surgery, there is one thing I have to mention. Um, nowadays that we do uh, the reconstruction called nipple sparing reconstruction where we even uh, preserve the nipple, we do not remove the nipple and the nipple areola complex is, is retained. Now, the blood flow to the nipple area is uh, uh, very tricky because it has to come all the way from uh, collarbone area up to the nipple, it is a long way for the blood to uh, come along the skin. So, sometimes this, the blood flow can get, uh, get affected and there could be slight degree of uh, ischemia and loss of the areola if it get worse. So, those are the common complications that we encounter during breast surgery for breast cancer. Now, for the benefit of our viewers, I have a very important question. In the case of early detection, if the disease has not spread and it is localized to the breast, is it 100 percent curable? Uh, again, I would say it, there are so many factors that we need to consider. One is uh, the grade of the tumour uh, and whether it is uh, uh, not a very bad uh, type of, uh, I mean, uh, tumour in the sense aggressive type of tumour. And the size of the tumour is very important and especially if it has gone, not gone to the nodes and if there is no involvement of uh, or small uh, uh, tumour cells found within the blood vessels. Then of course, I would say it is theoretically absolutely cured. Right. So, early detection is key in any form of cancer or any form of disease. When we talk about early detection, screening for breast cancer is one of the most important aspects that we want to emphasize in our conversation today. So, how should a female screen themselves for breast cancer? I will uh, answer it uh, which is pertinent to Sri Lankan population because uh, now when we talk about screening in developed countries, there are mass screening programs which are done through the government 
where it is a compulsory thing uh, for all the women uh, within the specific age group to go for the screening and pick it up. But in Sri Lanka, we do not have it. So, for Sri Lankans, what I normally encourage, uh, of course, uh, this is my view. Uh, there may be so many people who might not agree with me. But my view is that brief, breast self-examination, examining your own breast should be commenced very early in life. I would say it is always better to sort of uh, uh, start as soon as they leave school. So, I would say starting from 20 years. Uh, of course, some people might say this is too early and uh, they might sort of pick it up very non-cancerous benign lumps and they have to undergo unnecessary surgeries and all. But making them uh, as a habit to examine their breasts at least once a month will make a big impact. That's that's what I believe. So, what they have to do is uh, as soon as they finish their menses and when they are sort of uh, 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 taking a shower, they can sort of examine their own breasts. Uh, what they have to do is they can sort of stand in front of a mirror and sort of see the the, the, the two sides and see whether there is uh, a symmetrical uh, asymmetry of the breast and the nipples at the correct le uh, level. Then they can raise the hand and see whether there is any uh, difference between the movements of the, the two breasts. Then they can uh, sort of examine one breast uh, using the, the opposite hand and uh, considering the breast as a, as a face of a clock, they can start at 12 o'clock and keep on pressing the breast onto your chest wall. You should never feel the breast like this because when you feel it like that, you will feel the glands underneath. So, those are, I mean, you might think that there is a lump inside, it is not so, those are the glands. So, ideally you have to use the, the, the corner uh, tip of your three middle fingers and press on to the chest wall and sort of turn gradually and go from 12 o'clock like a sort of a, the arms of the clock. Go round and see whether the, whether you feel any lump which could slip under your fingers. So that that has to be done very very carefully. Then examine your armpit. Just put the hand under the armpit and just press down and see whether you can feel something. Again, don't feel the armpit like that. Uh, you might sort of feel the skin or maybe some uh, sweat glands. And do the other side, other side as well. Then squeeze the nipple and see whether there's any discharge. So this has to be started by about 20 years of your uh, of uh, age and do it every month and normally we Sri, Sri, uh, in Sri Lanka we the highest peak we see it around 50 to 55 years but I would say it is better to start sort of checking your breast by about 35 to 40. Now 35 years you cannot sort of do mammographies some radiologists might prefer if they come after 40 years but you can start with ultrasound scans. And of course, you can do once a year, that is more than enough. When you are 40, then of course, you can start the mammography as well. And mammography again, it is done once in 18 months to 2 years, not to sort of wait beyond 2 years. So, it is always better to sort of do this as when you start, it is better to sort of do it regularly at the correct time. If it is 18 months or 1 and a half years, it has to be done. There are so many ladies who come and say, when I ask them, okay, when did you do your last mammogram? They say about 10 years back. And that is not really uh, recommended because there is no point doing one mammography and sort of waiting for many, many years because that mammography does not valid more than 18 months. So, there is no point uh, just doing one and sort of forget about it. If you start, it is always good to sort of continue it every year if it is ultrasound and every one and a half years mammography. And of course, if there is a high risk such as the risk factors that, I, that we mentioned at the beginning, if you have any high risk factors, and if there is a risk of uh, having a, a gene going through your family, uh, then of course you have to pay more attention and do it at the precise time. Right. So, once again I want to reiterate the fact that self breast examination uh, as Dr. Nirmal suggested by the age of 20 and then ultrasound scanning and mammography as you uh, go towards the elderly years of your life is the key to early detection of breast cancer and like uh, doctor suggested it has to be regular. So, as we come towards the end of uh, this edition of Healthline, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Neomal Perra as a closing statement, what would be your take home message to our viewers? My take home message is always pick it up early and come uh, because uh, we can, I know I have seen so many patients 
uh, who go back with a smile and I want everybody to smile even though you have been diagnosed with a breast cancer. If it is so, it should be started from your end. You come with early disease, then you, I will make sure that you go with a smile. So that is our take home message. Pick it up early, do your part and that is one of the main reasons why we have this form, uh, sort of uh, programs so that you our viewers are aware as to how you should screen yourselves, what to look out for. So with that positive message, we come to an end of Healthline for this week and until I meet you again next week with your weekly dose of wellness, this is me Dr. Dilshan Fernando signing off, wishing all our viewers Aibo one.